Are we ready to go? Great. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our next session on interventions to address health inequity. Um, we're going to hear this afternoon about different interventions um, from different country perspectives and also at different levels at a more global perspective, um, at a national level and a more regional level to address some of these issues. Um, I'm going to be co-chairing along with Dr. Sumit Gupta, who's joining from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto virtually. Um, and it's now my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Gilberto Lopez, who's going to speak on access to cancer medicines in low-resource settings. Dr. Lopez is Medical Director for International Programs and Associate Director for the, Sylve for the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Miami, Chief of the Medical Oncology Division, and Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Miller School of Medicine. He currently serves in the Board of Directors for the Union for International Cancer Control and as Editor-in-Chief for the American Society of Clinical Oncology's JCO Global Oncology. Dr. Lopez has published more than 250 papers and book chapters and has been um, an investigator or steering committee member in more than 150 studies and clinical trials covering breast, geni um, gastrointestinal, just genitourinary, and thoracic cancers. His other main areas of research interests are in health disparities, health economics, value, policy, and access to cancer drugs and care in low and middle income countries. Um, Dr. Lopez, thank you so much for joining us from Miami today. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? I'll take that as a yes. Please do, I don't know, send me some smoke signals or a phone call if it's not working. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Good evening for those who are calling from Europe and from other parts of the world. As was introduced, my name is Gilberto Lopes. I'm a medical oncologist. And even though for us, medications, of course, is the most important thing that we do, I always like to start this talk by reminding everyone that while I'm talking about medications, medications do not work in a vacuum. We do need working healthcare systems, universal coverage, and everything else that we are discussing in this meeting over the last couple of days. I will focus on medications, but of course, that's not the only thing that we work on. The gentleman you actually see on the screen right now are my grandfather, that's the gentleman in the blue shirt, and his younger brother, my great uncle Fabio, with a red handkerchief. They represent that generation that came out of the countryside and came into cities over the last century, not just in Brazil, but actually around the developing world. And they are the generation that worked what they could in construction, uh, odd jobs to make sure that their children, especially their children's children, would be able to go to school and have the opportunities that they didn't and become physicians, lawyers. And again, the World Cup is going on and I am from Brazil, so we even have uh, football players in the family. Unfortunately, my great uncle Fabio did not get to see his granddaughters graduate from law school because he developed chronic myelogenous leukemia, CML, at a time in which imatinib was available in the US, Western Europe and high income countries, but not so in the public healthcare system in Brazil. After a short time fighting the disease, he came to die of it about a year uh, into his diagnosis. My grandfather, on the other hand, had served in the Brazilian army during World War II, and because of that, he had access to a different healthcare system, which is similar to what the Veterans Affairs VA system is in the US. So when he developed cancer, he was able to have a surgical procedure, he was able to have his adjuvant treatment, and he lived to 96, coming to die a couple years ago uh, almost to this date, actually, uh, from COVID. So this tells us the story of two brothers, same generation, absolutely similar, if not equal, life story, but because of the access that they had to different types of healthcare system, even though they both had diseases that could be treated and, if not cured, at least controlled, unfortunately, my great-uncle Fabio did not get to live to the extent that he could have given the medications that we have for CML. And that's what we talk about when we discuss global oncology. That's what we talk about when we discuss access to medications. And that's what we want to change around the world with the Adam Coalition that I'm going to use a few of the minutes we have today to discuss at the end of this presentation. These are my disclosures. And we have done well when we look at cancer care and control in high-income countries. Since 1991, we have seen cancer death rates drop by more than 30% in the U.S., and today more than two-thirds of patients who are diagnosed with cancer can live for five years or longer 
compared to less than 50% a few decades ago. And while a lot of this has to do with tobacco control and reduced rates of death by lung cancer, it also has to do with early diagnosis and treatment availability for a number of different diseases. Unfortunately, for those of us who still see patients in low-income settings, this does bring hope for the future, and these results are certainly an inspiration, but they're not our current reality. When we look at cancer mortality to incidence ratios, even in Europe, we see numbers that approach 0.5, and in LMICs, it's actually inverted. So we see two deaths for every three cases um, every year. So this is certainly a situation that we need to improve. In terms of cancer medications, there has been one great success story, which is imatinib. Imatinib has changed everything, and today patients with CML actually have a survival that parallels that of the population with the same age when we look at um, matched controls. Unfortunately, solid tumors are more complex, but even in solid tumors, we have made advances. And I'm going to use lung cancer as an example because that's what I do most in drug development. And that's what I do most in clinic today. We have now seen that for a certain subset of patients with lung cancer, such as those with DGFR mutations or ALK translocations, our treatments can help even patients with metastatic disease live for several years with much better quality of life. And without a doubt, ozimertinib improves progression for survival and overall survival, even when compared to early generation EGFR inhibitors. For patients um, that do not have specific mutations, immunotherapies have now changed the natural history of the disease, if not for the majority of patients, at least for those patients that have high expression of PD-1 or those patients that respond well to these treatments, we now see survivals in five years of about 15% when unselected and about 30%. And this is compared to less than 1% to 2% of patients surviving for four years before we had all of these treatments. Unfortunately, even when very highly clinically effective, these medications are not necessarily cost-effective. This is a study we published a couple of years ago showing that even though ozimertinib is very effective as compared to first-generation EGFR inhibitors and by consequence to chemotherapy, we really don't see that at current costs, they are cost-effective even in the U.S. setting, let alone Brazil. And unfortunately, we also see that low- and middle-income countries invest a lot less in cancer control than high-income countries. This is a paper we published in Nature Reviews a few years ago showing that while the U.S., United Kingdom, and uh, Japan invest hundreds of dollars per diagnosis of cancer in their healthcare systems, low-income countries in South America invest less than $8, in China less than $5, and in India even less than a dollar uh, per patient. So these are numbers that underscore how hard the situation is. And of course, with that, we have much less access in low income country to molecular testing and to new treatments. We also see that because there's less of an economic interest in low income countries, it also takes longer for new medications to be approved in jurisdictions outside of North America and um, Western Europe. It actually took us a decade or more working on chronic communicable diseases to be able to bring this to the fore in public health circles around the world. It took us the United Nations uh, high-level meeting about 10 years ago to actually finally make countries realize that even though infectious diseases and maternal child health is still important, it is clear that now most countries, even the poorest countries in the world, have chronic non-communicable diseases as the main cause of death within um, their, front, their borders. And this is true of uh, heart disease, and it is true of cancer as well. And this, even though it took quite some time, it finally started to change the needle because we now have a movement or at least an interest in dealing with cancer control and cancer treatment in low and middle income countries. We even have a target that I'm sure we're not going to meet by 2025, that's just three years ago, that patients around the world, uh, at least 80% should have access to essential non communicable disease medicines and uh, health technologies. And we are quite far away from having that happen. So one of the things that we did over the last few years is that the essential medicines list for cancer had not been reviewed for nearly a couple of decades. So using priority in terms of how common certain diseases are and what the benefit of specific systemic treatments are, we created a list that eventually was accepted by the WHO 
as a new list of essential medicines for cancer. This includes a number of generic agents that have been used for cancer for decades, but it also included for the first time monoclonal antibodies such as tuzumab and rituximab. And as you can imagine, as a personal victory, the addition of imatinib for CML as well as GIST. So this is the gardens at the WHO. We had the meeting. All these drugs are added to the essential medicines list. We can be confident and happy because on Monday, all patients back home are going to have access to these drugs. No, of course not. That's unfortunately not the way it works. By adding trastuzumab, we get the cost of adjuvant chemotherapy for uh, breast cancer from about $270 to more than $40,000. And the addition of rituximab has a corresponding effect as well in um, classic chemotherapy that is used for the medication. So why are these medications, especially new medications, so much so so much more expensive than older medications and generics? So one of the main factors, and I'm sure we can all uh, mention greed, or at least the uh, trying of pharmaceutical companies to extract as much benefit as they can from new drugs, it is indeed expensive in very costly as well as lengthy process to get new medications into the market. We have to screen tens of thousands of compounds in drug discovery to get a few hundred candidates in preclinical testing for every five drugs and each approved drug, and that process can take up to 15 years. And depending on the estimates, may cost up to two or three billion dollars. And we can always argue that these some of these numbers are not necessarily what we see in reality, but they are a representation, especially seeing how much more expensive it has become to bring a drug to market, how hard it has become to actually be able to afford these medications in low-income countries. So how and what can we do to increase access to cancer medication? And again, we could talk about this for a week, so I'm going to have to be brief because I, I think I barely have 20 minutes. But I do want to touch upon a few important topics. We need quality generics and biosimilars. We need to have systems into which what we actually charge in low-income countries is different than what we charge in high-income countries. And the technical economic term for that is price discrimination, but that sounds awful. So we tend to use affordable price uh, pricing or price tiering as a way of actually making uh, this process be better known in the communities that we work. And of course, we do need adequate healthcare funding. I'm not going to spend much time discussing universal coverage today. Uh, Value-based insurance design is something that has been tried and not well um, implemented over the last couple of decades. I will mention a little bit of public-private partnerships because that is what we're trying to do with the Adam Coalition that I will introduce to you in a few minutes and has now included almost 40 partners around the world after its, its launch over summer. So how do we improve cost effectiveness to be able to get these drugs to be more available? We can decrease the cost or we can increase the value. We have been able to show that making drug development cheaper and more effective by using biomarkers is feasible, but that unfortunately hasn't led to cheaper drugs. If anything, drugs that are more selective in specific subpopulation of patients, they have become more expensive. And of course, in the US, we do use generics biosimilars um, to actually increase access or to decrease the cost, rather, of certain medications. In low-income countries, it's a little hard. Even generics that are relatively cheap in this country are not as cheap in low-income countries, uh, mainly because the systems for procurement, for bringing the medications to the actual clinics and so on, do have uh, difficulties. If you have a small country, for instance, where you have 100 patients with cancer a year versus hundreds of thousands, it does become more expensive for you to be able to bring medications into uh, your healthcare system. Uh, this is just showing what I mentioned, that we have done a number of studies, and others have too, that when we do use biomarkers, we can make treatment more cost-effective, and that when we do use biomarkers in drug development, we can actually make it less costly to develop a new drug, and we can make it faster as well. Unfortunately, that has not so far translated into lower costs. Generics are extremely important in the U.S. and around the world. About 90% of medications in the U.S. that are dispensed are generics, and only about 21% of the actual cost of medications overall are represented by generics. And the cost of a medication can drop up to 80% with the introduction of generics. Usually, you need at least four or five companies competing with each indication or each drug uh, for that to happen, but it does happen. And in this country, 
the use of generics for the last uh, decade ending in 2016 generated almost $1.7 trillion in saving, savings, which is a significant amount. And we and others have shown that we can have similar levels of savings if we substitute for generics for those drugs that are off patent as well. I'm not going to belabor or discuss a lot of these. I just want to mention a couple of the challenges. Generics and biosimilars do still have a perception issue. We still see because of poor quality medications in certain jurisdictions, we do see that the perception for both patient and healthcare workers of generics and biosimilars is that many might be inferiors. But when we actually look at studies, we we had a study done a few years ago uh, that a pharmaceutical company actually ordered to try or, or sponsored or uh, funded rather to see if the generics for the drug that they made were actually lower quality. And in the end, they turned out to be higher quality. And I think that that paper never saw the light of day. But when generics are well made, they are equivalent to the originators. And we do have to continue getting that message. For biosimilars, it took a while for us to have biosimilars for trastuzumab and rituximab. We only have maybe two or three competitors. So prices have dropped by maybe 20 to 30 percent in the U.S., but we haven't seen prices that have dropped as much. But when we're talking about a drug that sells billions of dollars a year, even a 30 percent discount is significant savings for a healthcare system. And we hope to see more and more as we move forward. The biggest problem with new medications that are more effective is that they are protected by patents. So it becomes a lot harder for medications such as immunotherapy, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, and so on, that are changing the face of a number of diseases to be available in low-income countries. And here we start drawing a parallel with the situation for HIV medications back in the 90s when new protease inhibitors and other inhibitors actually changed the way we treated the disease with um, amazing improvements in prognosis that was not affordable in low-income countries. And that's where compulsory licensing became something that was talked and discussed. And that has been used for cancer medications a few times as well. So this goes back to 1995, the World Trade Organization Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property System Agreement went into effect in January 1995. And this is the legal mechanism that allows countries to produce or import generics while medications are still protected by patent on grounds of public interest. As I mentioned, we use this quite often for AIDS medications in the 90s and 2000s. It has occasionally been used for cancer medications, shown in a couple of examples. And even though we think of low and especially middle-income countries using this, the U.S. actually threatened to use um, compulsory licensing back in 2001, 2002 to generate stockpiles of ciprofloxacin during the anthrax scares that, fo that followed 9-11. So it is a mechanism that is legal, that is available, but that has seldom been used for cancer medication. So Thailand tried to use it in 2008 for docetaxel, letrozole, erlotinib, and initially for imatinib, but then the drug became available. And they actually had savings in excess of $140 million by doing so. In 2012, India uh, had a compulsory license for serafinib. And unfortunately, what ends up happening is that pharmaceutical companies will react to it. And in Egypt, Pfizer actually pulled out of creating and uh, building a new plant factory uh, because Egypt uh, issued a compulsory license for uh, Viagra. That tells you what happens when you have older generals uh, taking care of a country that's definitely not a medication for which I would have considered doing a compulsory license, but that's what they did. And with the Thai example in cancer medications, the office of the U.S. Trade Representative actually withdrew duty-free st status of a number of Thai products, which led to decreased exports, and that had economic consequences as well. And that's why we tend to mention compulsory license, but we prefer when it's used more as a uh, tool for negotiations rather than an actual mechanism. And that brings us to what we call price discrimination. This is an important concept in economics and business. Companies can charge different prices in different markets and, or segments, and they increase the number of consumers by doing that because people who would not be afford, uh, able to afford the, med the service, they end up being able to afford. And then these are examples, for instance, in the U.S., if you go to a movie theater on a Tuesday, you will pay a lot less than if you go on a Saturday evening. And in electronics, you have rebates, you have different mechanisms for which you can actually have uh, discounts for people that would be 
less likely or will have more time to try to go over the hoops to get the discount. In healthcare, this does happen, and I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to mention this that much. I just want to show this slide um, a few years ago that in healthcare, we actually did not do this at all. So this is back about 12, 13 years, a study that we did in Southeast Asia. And even though we have countries here that have a GDP per capita of 40,000 and countries with a GDP per capita of less than 1,000 a year, the price of a basket of medications was exactly the same. So we barely did any price discrimination. And a pharmaceutical product is actually the perfect type of product that is feasible for you to do price discrimination because the cost of generating that extra tablet it's just a few cents for about a dollar. And what really makes that medication expensive was the drug development process, as we mentioned. So we have since then led a number of pilot projects and a few companies have over the last 10 years actually created specific policies and do provide medications today at a different cost in low and middle income countries. Biggest challenges, you can have a little bit of a political backlash in high income countries because low in, lower income countries are uh, paying lower uh, prices. Of course, this is usually only an issue when countries at the same level of income actually have different prices. So Americans get very upset that the same medication in Canada can be 20 to 30 percent and sometimes even a lower price. But usually, as long as you explain, I haven't seen anybody getting upset because somebody in Tanzania would pay a fraction of what you pay for a medication in the US. The biggest problem, however, is that even a 90% lower price is still not low enough if we don't have universal coverage and if we don't have enough of an investment in um, healthcare. One interesting example, just uh, to illustrate how complex the access to medication issue can be, there's a couple of countries that actually allow their citizens to sue the state uh, I don't know if the countries actually allow or, or the mechanisms that exist in some democratic states end up leading to lawsuits. Unfortunately, often these come from states or from families or from patients that actually have enough money to hire lawyers to be able to sue the state. So it ends up creating different types of disparities that we won't have time to discuss today. I just wanted to mention uh, an interesting and unusual example that is common in both Brazil and Colombia. And that brings us to the Access to Oncology uh, Medicines, ADAM Coalition. So I mentioned the challenge. We have difficulty bringing medications, including generics and biosimilars, but especially so for patented protected medications. And we have been discussing these issues for a couple of decades, and we wanted to be the glue that binds together partners that are working on this issue so that we can finally start to move the needle forward. And this was launched over summer in Geneva uh, with the Union for International Cancer Control, UICC, the Medicines Patent Pool, the American Center for Clinical Pathology, and Project ECHO as some of the main um, um, collaborators. And this new established global coalition hopes to not just increase access to essential cancer medications in low-income and lower-income countries, but also to be able to help increase the capacity for the proper handling, treatment, and supply monitoring. So the idea is not just to make medications affordable and available, but to guarantee that they get used as they should be used. And we are hoping to do that by bringing together public and private sector partners with expertise in implementing cancer-focused access programs, from education to actual um, logistics with, within the medication um, chain, supply chain. And we will place priority in the, those medications that are currently on the EML or likely to be included in the near future to treat those cancers that have high incidence to mortality rates in the countries in question, including lung, colorectal, breast, cervical, prostate, and of course, childhood cancers. Our approach is one of addressing these um, this availability of the lack of medications in these countries and to also help create the capacity to use them in a sustainable and scalable way. And we hope to do so by complementing existing models and amplifying them through an innovative multi-sectoral access mechanism. And hopefully by bringing together these partners from across sectors of the global, regional and national levels with expertise and track record in addressing the key access barriers will be able to improve the situation in the next few years. I'm running out of time, so let me just very quickly mention the three pillars of work, which is to improve the capacity 
to receive and use the cancer medicines in an adequate manner, hopefully making available more WHO, EML, generic and biosimilar medicines over time. And the third pillar is to try to bring those patent medications to low income markets earlier by voluntary licenses and other potential products. This is a partial list. We have more than 37 partners that have joined us right now. We have worked on our governance with an executive committee, and we also have a coalition council and a private sector council, as well as country coordination groups that we are working on right now. And we have uh, expert advisory groups, including for medications, diagnostics, and pathology, and soon we're gonna be working on one for finance. And we hope that this will move the needle and will finally help us bring medications that can be life-saving to the lowest income, to the most in need patients around the world. In conclusions, we have made significant improvements in the treatment of cancer in general, but um, most of our new drugs are not readily available in low and middle income countries. The WHO EML has included a number of new therapies and I only showed you the revision we had in 2015, even more um, newer and more expensive medications have been added over the last years. And we clearly need to continue developing multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder initiatives to address these disparities. I'm gonna stop here and um, let me close the slides and I think we'll get back to our moderator. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Lopez. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. My name's uh, Sumit Gupta. I'm a pediatric oncologist here in Toronto, Canada. Um, I'm very jealous of all of you who are there in person. It would have been lovely to be there, and my apologies for not being able to. Um, so Dr. Liliana Vasquez, as I said, it's a great pleasure to introduce her. Looking at the bio that she sent me, it's very brief, which is very much in keeping in how humble um, of an individual Dr. Vasquez is. It simply states that she's a pediatric oncologist from Peru um, who has a master's in global health and who has served as past president of the Latin American Society of Pediatric Oncology and that she does some consulting for the WHO. Um, what it doesn't say, and which I uh, happen to know, is that she is one of the key individuals behind really remarkable and exemplary efforts that the Peruvian Ministry of Health has made to improve um, childhood cancer care delivery over the last five years, um, but that have really functioned as an exemplar for other countries in the region and beyond. Um, and I think in part because of that, the work that she does with PAHO and the WHO at the moment is in guiding other countries um, across Central and South America and the Caribbean in trying to um, create and implement similar policies. So I think that's um, what we have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Vasquez talk to us about today. So with no further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to her. Thank you so much, Sumit, for, for this kind introduction. And uh, I will start with my presentation. And thank you so much for the invitation to this session about interventions to address health uh, inequities, and I'm really, really happy to share with you some of the work that it's been done in pediatric cancer in, in Peru, but also in several countries in Latin America. So briefly, I would like to begin with some thoughts about the childhood cancer survival gap and how this is a problem that we need to take a look very importantly when we speak about health inequities because uh, the reality for many of the countries, many low and middle income countries is that the survival gap has been, it continues to be to widen. And uh, this is not the same situation for high income countries in which we can see that several advances on molecular biology, CAR T cells and the access to drugs in childhood cancer have allowed to improve the survival for, for the children with cancer. This is not situa the situation for many countries, specifically in Latin America as well. And when we talk about Latin America and the region, we see that almost 29,000 children and adolescents will be affected by cancer. And most of the Children will be will come from South America, a smaller proportion from Central America, Dominican Republic, Mexico, and a 
a small proportion as well from the Caribbean countries. But this is only to mention that this is not, these are not rare diseases, and that the basically the cost effectiveness that represents childhood cancer in public health is important because it's now being considered more than ever that um, it's a problem and an issue for public health. And also that the disparities for Latin America are very predominant. And we can see that uh, in Latin America and the Korean, for example, we can have countries like Bolivia, like Peru, mostly the Andean region, interestingly, um, Ecuador, Colombia, that could have survival rates that are way um, inferior to the average in, in the region or in the world. And countries that are very similar to we can see uh, in, in high income countries, uh, like Uruguay, for example, um, Chile. So those are some of the examples that we can we can analyze. And, and uh, when we speak about disparities and inequities, and uh, that means that the survival rates could vary between 40% up to 80% in, in a region. So that was one of the basis of what, why the WHO uh, Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer started, because it was a, a global effort to improve the situation mostly in the countries that are part of these inequities that needed to improve the situation and to in the care for these children. And that started a few years ago with several conversations, uh, high level meetings uh, in Geneva, and then it was formally launched in 2018. And as a region, as Latin America, Peru was the first country that was elected as a focus country for, as a pilot for this global initiative. So the framework in which we work uh, on this global initiative is based on four pillars. One is for the center of excellence, the universal health coverage, the regimens of management, the evaluation and monitoring, and three enablers, say, um, advocacy, financing, and governance. So this is a framework that we're, we're using also to help to provide technical assistance to the member states in order to first prioritize child cancer as a public health issue and to put it into the agenda of the a national cancer control plan or a pediatric cancer uh, plan or a plan of action for the country. And in second uh, place, to start the mobilization of different stakeholders, including St. Jude, uh, Sick Kids, for example, um, as an important stakeholder, foundation, civil society, universities, academic um, uh, uh, societies, and many others. And as a region, as Latin America, we're working in based on a strategic plan that is allowing us to start working with these different stakeholders in order to achieve three main outcomes. One is at the national level to work in the implementation of what we call the two old projects or the main interventions that are part of this plural uh, framework, as we mentioned, basically registry, um, access to medicines. I really like the, the representation that Dr. Lopez was saying because it is a very, very much important pillar also for the WHO Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, but not only that, Center of Excellence, training of healthcare workers, and some other different projects that are part of this framework and how to implement them in at the national level. In second, as a second outcome, um, the mobilization of the governments to have a national cancer control plan or a pediatric cancer control plan it, or at least um, a non-communicable diseases plan that could include cancer and of course childhood cancer into the agenda. A regulation for childhood cancer, a national cancer control, a childhood cancer law that allows uh, the country to improve the care of these children. And in third place, um, the, how we can impact on or reduce the impact on uh, different um, factors that could affect mortality for these children. And there are many, uh, several um, factors that are 
are very common to our countries in, our, in the region, abandonment of treatment, delayed diagnosis, uh, mortality due to infections, and some others that are uh, important problems that could be also uh, focused uh, in a regional level and that are very important if we want to decrease uh, the mortality of these children. So from a regional perspective, we want to work in uh, two levels, the national level and the regional level. First, to implement this initiative in, in countries of the Americas and also as a regional level to develop regional dialogues, projects and products um, basically on these main topics. So as the first objective uh, in the implementation of the Cural Technical Package in, in the region, so far we have 15 countries that are part of the WHO uh, Pediatric Cancer Initiative that in which the, the, the Ministry of Health um, is giving us uh, the permission the the has uh, have had a positive uh, response to a technical cooperation between WHO and the government, and of course with the involvement of different stakeholders. So we have now 15 countries that are part of this initiative, three countries that are uh, uh, having activities related to pediatric cancer, but it's not, has been stated as a priority as a country, and two countries that are now in dialogue. And also to comment that to have the, the what we call the, the permission, the anuencia of the countries to, to work in this, in, in this topic does not mean that it's fully implemented in the country, because we know that um, we have to mobilize uh, different actors in order to have to, to achieve different steps of the implementation. First, a situational diagnosis for pediatric cancer in the country, then in the, uh, a second phase of planning, costing of the activities that are relevant for the countries, which are the most urgent issues for pediatric cancer in the country, and then to start the implementation of these activities. Um, and I like this graphic very much because it has a lot of flags of different countries in, in Latin America and the Caribbean in the order that the ministries of health have agreed to be part of this initiative of the GACC. And we can see that Peru was the first uh, country, the focus country for, for the initiative coming to the phase one assessment, the planning, the implementation, and now the monitoring. And we have four countries, Peru, Panama, El Salvador, and Dominican Republic that are now fully implementing the activities related to the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer. Meaning that the work with these countries are very different. Some of them prioritize different aspects of public health related to pediatric cancer. Some of them are more focused on early detection. Some of them are more focused on registry or essential drugs or training packages. So these are the difference that we respect. And of course, we are trying to provide the, the specific technical guidance for them. And when we see also this in the, as a perspective, the cure-all framework is always different in several pillars and enablers because the work that we um, are trying to do or we're trying to, to, to guide in, in the countries is very related also to the political will. Some of the, the activities that we do in a phase could change over time as well. About the second objective about national cancer control plans or regulations or any national policy that is related to pediatric cancer, I think it's very important because we know that Probably governments and um, authorities could change over time, but what is uh, relevant for, for a government is to have a specific operational plan that could be followed toward the years, during several years and in the future. And we can see that if we look five years back, uh, we can see that it has been uh, improving uh, during the recent years. In the last five years, there has been an increase of 62% in, 
in the number of countries that now have a national cancer control plan in the region or a pediatric cancer control plan. So this is a good uh, outcome, but I think there's much more to do still with the countries. And also something interesting is that the example of Peru was that we start work, we started working with the authorities, with the ministries of health, with legislators to, to develop a childhood cancer law. And several countries also were starting to, to develop either a cancer law or a childhood cancer law. This is the example of Colombia with the Ley Jacobo in 2020, Chile with the Ley uh, with the cancer law that was approved that year, Brazil. Argentina is not there, but also Argentina approved um, uh, childhood cancer law this year. So there are several interesting examples. And uh, I, as I always think is that the, the work that it's been done in a country is contagious to other countries as well. Uh, I, I could say that, for example, if we look like six or seven years ago, many of the academic meetings when we used to talk about public health and childhood cancer, there were always the same countries, right? Like Argentina, Brazil, Chile, they have a strong national childhood cancer control plans. But now we can start to think uh, about other, we can, we can, um, also hear good news from other countries. One example is Peru, but also Colombia, uh, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic. So that is something that it's really interesting and very favorable to, to the region and of course to the world. And finally, the third objective, the, it's related to the reduction of the impact of several factors that are associated with mortality through regional dialogues, regional products. So for this objective, we started a really nice work uh, since last year, 2021, June, and we uh, formed a SPAHO, uh, seven working groups on main important topics, or detection, abandonment of treatment, supportive care, palliative care, nutrition, nursing, and psychosocial with experts from different countries, from. 17 countries in the region uh, with more than 2,200 participants to develop uh, specific products that could be um, produced by Latin American experts, but also for the, the centers in the region, for the colleagues, and even for the community. And this has been a really interesting work that it's ongoing, how we have so far published regional snapshots for uh, early detection, for abandonment of treatment, for, uh, for nutrition, for um, nursing, manuals, guidelines that are related to the nutritional care of, uh, of the children with cancer, psychosocial care of children with cancer, and also the support to specific projects that could be expanded to the region in telemedicine, uh, regional campaigns, uh, that uh, were also uh, are important for many of us. And speak, speaking specifically for Peru, um, the, the example of Peru is very interesting and I think very inspiring because um, the thanks to the mobilization and even during the pandemic, we started to work with this uh, under the umbrella of the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer. And we have been, um, developing several projects and at a national level. One example is a hospital-based registry platform. And most of all, uh, the development of a network, uh, hospital-based registry network with 13 hospitals that are now working on the registry and uh, through a platform that, it's, uh, that belongs to the Ministry of Health and, and with the support of PAHO. And, um, and also a, a national observatory of, of cases. The decreasement of abandonment of treatment, because uh, for me, this is the most important part, how, how we can translate the success to outcomes that could be uh, relevant for us. And one example is the abandonment of treatment. Historically, Peru had uh, a rate of abandonment of 18% since 20, 2012, until 2018, 
And then after the work, many teams in several uh, hospitals in the country that the number of 18 percent uh, of abandonment of treatment at a national level dropped to 8.5 percent. So this was after one year of the implementation of several strategies, including a national network for foundations, the a navigator program within the countries and with in, in five centers, um, the use of um, the registry to monitor the cases. So this is a really interesting example also, not invented by the teams at Peru, because we also use many of the experience that were already published, for example, from El Salvador, from Guatemala, from several other countries that reduced their abandonment previously. The regulation, the approval, and then the regulation of the National Childhood Cancer uh, Law, that was a milestone for us because it uh, provides hope to parents to have a paid license for them and some social protection for families that are affected and have a children with cancer. And that gives the name of a national uh, childhood cancer program within the Ministry of Health. And this is an ongoing work so far. And finally, the strengthening of skills of, of the workshop or workforce to create by creating a national education program. And so even when the goal of the GCC is to achieve uh, a survival rate of at least 60%, the idea is to improve the access of the diagnosis for every, every child in the, in the region and hopefully to, to contribute to this globally. Thank you so much for the attention and also to the, all the collaborators that are listed here and the PAHO team. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Vasquez. And it's my pleasure now to welcome the last speaker for today's session, Dr. C.S. Pramesh, who's joining us virtually. Um, Dr. Pramesh is the director of the Tata Memorial Hospital and the professor and head of thoracic surgery at the Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai. He serves on the UICC Board of Directors and is the convener for the National Cancer Grid a large network of 266 cancer centers in India, which provides uniform standards of cancer care across the country. Uh, Dr. Pramesh is highly committed to efforts toward reducing inequities in cancer care uh, and making cancer treatment accessible to all geographic regions. Uh, he's also a visiting professor at the Division of Cancer Studies at King's College London and the Institute of Cancer Policy at King's Health Partners. Dr. Um, Dr. Pramesh has strong interest in clinical trial design, surgical trials, comparative effectiveness research, collaborative research, health services research, and cancer policy, and has more than 250 peer-reviewed papers on these topics. Um, I will now turn it over to um, Dr. Pramesh's prepared presentation. Good afternoon, friends. At the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our experience with creating one of the world's largest cancer care networks in India called the National Cancer Grid. The idea to create this network started from this heat map of patients who visited the Tata Memorial Hospital over a six month period. So we geotagged 75,000 patients who visited us during this period based on their geographic location of their residence. And as you can see, this fairly dense uh, map of patients who come from in and around the city of Mumbai where we are located is fairly understandable. However, what is disturbing is the large number of patients who come to visit us from the northern, the eastern and the northeastern part of India, often traveling thousands of kilometers to be able to access quality cancer care. Added to this is the fact that the projected cancer burden in India is likely to go up by 70 percent over just two and a half decades. In addition to this, there are several economic inequities in access, primarily based on the fact that the total public healthcare expenditure is a mere 1.5% of the GDP, which means that most of the expenditure on healthcare is from out-of-pocket expenses from patients. 
just to give you an idea of how much that means if you were to compare it with a country like the united kingdom uh, the united kingdom has uh, a annual gdp expenditure of 12.8% uh, uh, on their gdp whereas india spends 1.5% per capita gdp of uh, uh, uk is 40000 us dollars whereas that of india is approximately 2000 us dollars which means that the average healthcare expenditure for a citizen in the uk is upwards of 5000 us dollars whereas in india it is just $29. Ernst & Young did uh, a report a few years back uh, looking at the gaps between what was existent and what was required. And as you can see, many of these, including the number of linear accelerators, cancer beds, cancer centers, and human resource, were roughly half of what was required in 2020. And again, to give you context, uh, the Tata Memorial Center is a sister institution of the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And we are remarkably similar in many ways. We see almost the same number of patients annually. And while the MD Anderson has 1,700 physicians and researchers, uh, the Tata Memorial has only 188. So we were faced with this rather alarming situation where we needed to work quickly to be able to eliminate these disparities. And therein, we started this idea of creating a network of existing cancer centers, primarily with a view to have uniform standards of cancer care, developing trained human resource, and to be a ready platform for collaborative multicentric cancer research. Today, it has grown over the last decade to over 280 cancer centers, research organizations, patient groups, and professional societies from across the length and breadth of the country. One of the first activities that we undertook was to do a gap analysis, uh, estimating the growing burden of cancer in India, the priorities and global results as far as cancer research was concerned, but most importantly, how we could deliver affordable and equitable cancer care in the country. We came up with our first version of evidence-based guidelines in 2017, where all common cancers had evidence-based guidelines being created, which was signed up by all the member centers. We also went into an effort of identifying what was high value and what was low value care. And we identified 10 low value or harmful practices that should be avoided in cancer care uh, called Choosing Wisely India. And this is available in the Lancet Oncology for those of you who are interested in knowing what these 10 recommendations were. In 2019, uh, spilling on to 2020, we created uh, another set of guidelines, the second edition of this, which are now resource stratified in the sense that here we take value into the equation as well. So we uh, stratify our guidelines into essential or mandatory, optimal, which is value-based, and optional, which does not take value into the picture. To create uniform standards, we have a process of institutional peer review where institutions which are part of the cancer grid can volunteer to have their institutions reviewed by an expert group where a team of uh, experts from the NCG centers uh, share data with the uh, center which needs to be uh, peer reviewed and come up with a site visit and a peer review report which is shared with the leadership of the respective center. Quality is central to everything that we do. And one of the fundamental aspects of cancer care is quality in surgical pathology and diagnosis. So we created an external quality assurance scheme wherein the quality of reporting is evaluated and reported back to individual centers. We have now expanded this to include molecular pathology quality assurance as well. Expanding on our role of quality in pathology, we also look at quality in overall patient care and we run this course called NCG Equip, which trains individuals on how to look at quality within a healthcare institution. Knowing the difficulties that patients have in getting expert opinions, we created a web-based uh, expert opinion service, wherein all that a patient needs to do is to upload their reports, including DICOM images, pathology images, onto a secure website, which is then sent to an expert within the NCG who offers their expert opinion all within a median turnaround time of under 24 hours. Knowing the challenges that some of the 
smaller centers might have to have individual disease specific multidisciplinary tumor boards we created virtual tumor boards almost 6 years back wherein experts from across the ncg centers weigh in on opinions for complex cancer clinical situations leveraging the fact that we are a large group we negotiate in bulk for cancer drugs from pharmaceutical industry so we aggregate the demand from the ncg centers there is a central tendering and negotiation process and we use surrogates for quality of the drug so that the quality of the drug is also assured and the final contracts are signed between the individual pharmaceutical companies and the centers and we have been able to get discounts ranging anywhere from 20% to 95% on the maximum retail price of a drug we also did a proof of concept on patient health records and integrated this with the national digital health mission wherein with patient consent uh, data and electronic medical records of their individual patients could be shared across healthcare providers thereby reducing the cost of care and avoiding duplication of investigations and treatment recently we have commissioned the ncg center for digital oncology in an effort to centralize and adopt digital tools and technology for cancer care in india which has been funded by the koita center uh, koita foundation which uh, supports us in this effort the koita center for digital oncology is working towards unifying electronic medical records have synoptic formats for reporting enable interoperability of data thereby enabling seamless exchange of patient health records digitization of treatment protocols or guidelines and the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence to augment diagnostics and patient care pathways are some of the planned activities of the center we still have many initiatives that are uh, being planned including integrated data collection and aggregation the creation of a rare cancer and an exceptional responder registry leveraging the fact that we are a large group we plan to extend the group negotiation that we did for cancer drugs to other equipment like linear accelerators pet ct scans mri scans and so on and we are embarking on an effort of health technology assessment to ensure that the guidelines are truly value based an effort of this nature would not be possible without the support of several organizations some of which are listed in this slide here and we are very grateful to them for their continuing support thank you very much for your attention and i'll be happy to take any questions during the discussion section hey okay, thank you very much to all of our speakers um dr gupta and i will um take any questions i can take some from here in the room and and dr gupta if there are any coming in from online that would be great um any questions here from the group for our speakers I can I have a a question to kick us off. Um you know I think I was struck in all of the presentations around sometimes this um tension between government action and um sort of private sector reaction to that you know um uh, Dr. Lopez you touched on that in in your talk where uh, around compulsory licensing as well and and I think um Dr. Pramesh had sort of also discussed around how the national cancer grid in india has been able to kind of work around some of the challenges um as well and i wondered for any of our speakers if you could sort of comment on a little bit more on that tension and and sort of where the greatest risk, where or where you think the greatest opportunity is um sort of from government action and and governments working with um organizations on the ground dr vasquez you also you know touched a lot about how these different levels work together um or do we really need to be partnering further with with industry where do you think we're going to have the big, biggest progress moving forward uh i can go first i think everybody has to give a little more i think governments especially in low income countries have to invest a little more in the management of cities in general and cancer in particular and i think that companies have to be more willing to bring uh, some of the prices and also to invest in capacity building a little bit more as well Thanks very much Dr. Um Dr. Vasquez I don't know if you've anything to to add to that. Dr. 
Dr. Vasquez, can you hear us? I think so. Okay. Maybe we can. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Um, well, if maybe we'll put out one more call if there are any questions from anyone in the room. Otherwise, I think we're we're just about at time. Um, Dr. Gupta, do you have anything you'd like to to add in? I don't know if Dr. Vasquez can hear us. If she is, I had one quick question, but so she wrote she wrote in the chat that she cannot hear us, but maybe she can see the chat. I can try and type it out quickly. That's okay. Uh, I think we're probably out of, uh, out time. of time. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, a big thank you to our speakers and thank you, Dr. Vasquez and Dr. Lopez for signing in today. Really appreciate it and, and wonderful to have you both here. Thanks very much. Thank you.